it doesn't seem to matter how many times I sit down to start working in my sketchbook. There is always a moment of apprehension. And that moment of apprehension, I don't think, goes away. But I, I think it is minimized by just continuing to get in there and continuing to work. Sometimes I find that things like digital or working with a pencil can help to kill some of that apprehension because there is an idea that, well, if this doesn't go well, I can just erase this. And that's true. There is some relief, some pressure relief from knowing that things are not permanent. I also think there's something beneficial from working with a medium like pen where there is some permanence to what you're doing. I think that it can be really beneficial. It almost tricks your brain. Your, your brain kind of sits there and goes, okay, well, we can't fix this if it goes awry, so we might as well, you know, make sure we get it, get it right. Now, when you're working with pen, there is um, the ability to work with white pen or paint or white out or things like that to go over at some point. I don't often do that, but I have been working with some white gel pen recently or white acrylic pen, and it's been pretty nice, pretty lovely, mostly because it's been allowing me to work in highlights on this lovely tan paper. So here we are, we're just eating through apprehension, getting some art done, because if we don't get some art done, then we slowly go crazy. Today I'm going to be working on, <laughs> I say that like I'm committed, which I am really not. At this moment, I'm working on some dinosaur slash dragon heads. I'll be having some references off screen that are just gonna help give me some, some basic ideas for things. I'm not copying them right now, though there's nothing wrong with copying some references to hopefully gain some new skills and learn some things. That's just not what I'm doing right now. I'm mostly using it as vague inspiration and help with things like head structure and how the anatomical components come together. A couple things recently, just through my own research and some lovely insights from some other creators has been inclined toward using reference as a tool to help you, but only really when you need it. The idea that if you just copy things from reference, you don't really get better. You get better at the very specific thing that you're copying, if you're lucky. But most of the time when you, when you copy references, you just get better at copying things. You get better at looking at details and understanding how to break them down and how to create that version of them on your, your page or your canvas. To actually improve in drawing from imagination, you can't just copy 10,000 figures and poses. That's not going to magically give you the ability to create poses and figures from your imagination. It will probably anecdotally help but the reality is most of that improvement is just from having done it over and over and over again. If you really want to get good at drawing figures, then you kind of have to draw a figure, see where your shortcomings are, and then focus on those individual components. Right now, if I drew this guy, this creature, and did it without any reference material, one of the components I would run into is the head just doesn't look quite right. The structure doesn't feel anatomically logical. And so that's part of what I'm looking at reference wise right now. I'm not copying it exactly. I'm trying to understand why, why the eye looks the way it does, why 
these little inset components are the way they are. I feel like recently I've gotten a decent understanding of the three-dimensional aspects of like how the head structure functions. Obviously, it's pretty easy to understand and remember all the components you have to have. Like, you know, ear is going to be somewhere back in here. Might not be totally visible. I'll go ahead and put it in just because why not? The eye has to be there and be visible. The nose, the teeth. You've got the jaw muscle that comes around this way. And then it wraps up. You can see these striations to the top of the skull in order to have that chomp force so that it can actually come down and crush and break and rip and tear in the way that a carnivorous animal like this would need to do. So those pieces are things that I'm aware of. That doesn't mean that I necessarily have the ability right off the, right off the bat to represent them, but they're things that I've, I've drawn and thought about enough times that they occur I wouldn't say they occur in my subconscious yet. It's more that they readily come to my conscious mind. I think that you probably could get to where it occurs in your subconscious, subconscious, sorry, but that would take a long time. That would take a lot of times of doing this. And I haven't gotten there yet with, with really anything drawing wise. Everything for me still has to be done via processing and thinking. But a lot of those things now are much more readily accessible to me. I don't have to really sit there and stop and contemplate, oh goodness, what do I do next? My brain just kind of goes, oh, well, if we're around the jawline here, then we should probably put that part in. And that's nice. But that took a long time to get to. And I am certainly, certainly still learning a tremendous amount about how to do this. I have yet to decide, and maybe never will decide, if drawing dragons and dinosaurs is a particularly efficient use of my time. I've also simultaneously come to the realization that I don't care. I don't care if drawing these things is not the most efficient way to get better because there's some innate joy in putting these weird creatures together. And because I enjoy it, it keeps me in it. It keeps me doing the work. And that's that's a good thing. That's something that I've got to uh, cling to. And I don't know if this is common for many of you, but a lot of my time artistically over the last 10 or 15 years has not been particularly pleasure, um, pleasurable. It's been a lot of time focusing on work and focusing on getting better. And I have, but I think I've actually improved less than I would have otherwise because I've been too highly focused on just improving skills. So I have notebooks and sketchbooks full of drawings from Bridgman and anatomical studies and the reality is that those things are beneficial in and of themselves, but they weren't tying up and linking to the things that I wanted to do. And because of that, I might spend two or three weeks studying really fervently, and then I wouldn't practice the things that I learned for a couple of months. And so I would unlearn most of what I learned. When you're studying very detailed anatomical components of the human figure, that stuff has to be reiterated and drawn and referenced and thought about meticulously for a very long period of time before it sticks and becomes a permanent part of your repertoire. And I, I think I was unwilling to put in that time because it just, it wasn't linking up to what I wanted to do. I was stupid about it. I should have purposefully tried creating new characters and fun things that were tied into that. And I think if I had, I probably would have had more fun with it and I would have kept doing it and I would still have retained those skills. As it is right now, I don't know that I still retain much. I would probably learn it faster when I went to do it again. But I don't know that I've actually retained much at all from some of those courses and classes that I've taken. 
and I'm I tend towards being upset about that but again I value the realization that I now have that oh like I've got to I've got to have it linked to what I want to do and what I desire artistically and if I can do that then I'm going to stick with it better I'm going to implement the things I learned as opposed to just learn them as the abstract things and then I will actually utilize them I'll actually grow and I kn I feel like I know that now and if I can keep reiterating it to myself and forcibly banging my head against the wall only when necessary to just keep slowly getting better and practicing things then I will I'll benefit from it long term and that pain, the pain of the inefficiency of that time will have been worth it. And I hate being inefficient. I hate it so much. But you can't always be efficient. When you're learning how to read or write, like you're not, your time is not being well spent. When I was first learning how to play guitar, my, my practice time was not good. I would, I would practice for a few minutes on scales or chords or something lame that I didn't want to do. And then, you know, I would play a Blink-182 song or uh, some Newfound Glory or whatever, you know, song I'd learned from my instructor that last week. And that wasn't particularly good practice time, but it kept me doing the work. And then eventually I got proficient enough that I could have a little bit of fun in the practice. I could make the practice more entertaining. So yeah, I think I that revelation has been really beneficial to me. And I, I think I've only really had it in the last couple weeks. But I feel like it's now part of my psyche. And will probably be there. I, goodness, I hope it will be there forever now. Um, but I'm probably going to have to remind myself of it pretty frequently, at least for a while, because it's counter to how I've done things for a long time. And so I'm going to have to be reminded of it. I don't find that you often learn things that it's just one, one time. Okay, I got this now. I'm good. That's not usually how that works. Usually it feels like they're things that you you wrap your head around and you have for a little bit of time, and then you get distracted, you do something else, and then you've got to go back later. And remember, you've got to go remind yourself. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. All right, we're going to slide to the next guy here. I'm going to see what we, so we get here. I'm just going to go straight in with the pen, with the pen this time. Probably should have warmed up before I started. I've never gotten that as part of my habit, and I know that it's good, but it's never been a part of my routine. I don't do it with working out either, <laughs> which is another another area that I know it's really beneficial to warm up. It's just not something that's that's normal to me, so I don't do it, and I need to get better. Do you guys have any warm-ups that you do for drawing? To be to be totally honest, I haven't I haven't looked into it much. So whilst I know it's something that I'm supposed to do, I don't really know even what that means. I would imagine it's probably some very simple guided guided drawing, like maybe just focusing on line quality and thickness or squares and cubes and boxes. I would imagine it's not like real, real advanced stuff. But I could be wrong. So yeah, if you have anything that you do for warming up, please let me know in the comments because I don't have that yet and would love to get some more of that into my repertoire. Also, if you're enjoying these sketching sessions, I would love to hear what you're working on while you're doing them. And if you want to see more of them in the future, please consider subscribing. No pressure. 
I would like you to subscribe if this will be enjoyable for you and you'd like to be reminded when these things can't come live. But no pressure. That doesn't help anything. What is up with this guy? He's got this long jaw thing that I seem to always enjoy and gravitate towards. Don't know that I put a lot of time and energy into actually thinking about what it would do. <laughs> I think if I was ever going to go back and get another degree from university, it would likely be scientific. There's a good chance that I would go back and do biology or zoology of some kind or chemistry because I really, I've grown to like math as an adult. I know a lot of people really, really dislike math, but I love the order of it. I love how Everything has its place and everything makes sense. And it has reasons for why it makes sense. And that always felt almost relaxing. I think I spent a lot of time doing really bizarrely creative things in high school. And it was always comforting to come back to math and realize that math is just math. That it, it has an objective right answer. Because in art, so much of the time, there is no objective right answer. And that's fine. Um, most of reality doesn't really have an objective right answer, it seems, when it comes to creative things, at least. But I think our brains want there to be objective truth. We want, us, we want there to be an objective right way to draw, an objective what right way to live. And... I think there is, but we're so, so simple as beings. And so I, I doubt that we'll ever totally uncover exactly what that looks like. This guy's got some fearsome teeth there in the front that I'm not sure are really going to serve much of a purpose. He has a small amount of musculature here to go around the upper portions of his skull and give him the chomping power. So he's not really going to have a ton of jaw strength. But... He's got these fearsome looking teeth. Maybe he's venomous. I mean, that would that would kind of explain what's happening here. Maybe he's venomous and these these are you know, venom injecting fangs. Or um more likely, he looks like a gharial or a garfish, which are these a gharial is a um, a croc crocodile relative that has this really, really thin set of jaws that kind of looks like this from the top. It's got this little bulbous thing at the end of their nose, which is where they get their name. And then their head structure kind of comes back like this. And you got their, their eyes. And these mouths are super, super long and super skinny. And they're used for catching fish because all of the tiny little teeth um, or just give you that many points of friction to catch the, the fish. And I run like in a, in a really cool way when they catch the fish, what they'll do is they'll catch it maybe up here and then they'll open and shut their mouth like, you know, like, like this and slowly just like hop the fish down towards the base of their mouth and their throat where they can swallow it. So this guy kind of looks like that kind of looks like a gharial and how he's structured, so I'm gonna assume he's a fish eater. And it's not necessary, I suppose, to contemplate these things when you're drawing a creature. You don't need to know what it eats, but I think that it helps with the ideating process. I think that it helps you immediately make decisions. So because I started thinking about that, I stopped making these fang-type teeth. I started to give them a longer neck, and I started to make sense of some of these things. The eye structure here too is 
probably an eye that's going to be um, okay being submerged. Though I'm not sure it's quite high enough on the brow to have the crocodilian and alligator type of situation where it's visible above the edge of the water. But again, I'm not designing for anything specific right now, so I didn't need to sit down and come up with that concept before I started the guy. If I was designing for a specific purpose, that's what I would have done. I do think it's really beneficial, though, as you're drawing, to think about these little things, just to think about the why. Why does he do this? Why does he have this? It just helps with the making of decisions. And if making those decisions is not something that you struggle with, not something that you need help with, then whatever. Just, just keep doing as you're doing. I'll need to look into these scales that I do around the jaws. I've just run into enough times when I'm doing close-ups of large lizards or snakes that they seem to have scale structures right around their jaw. And it adds a little bit of authenticity to me when I'm looking at the thing. But I'm not sure if it's present on all reptiles off the top of my head. And I'm not sure what this chunk right here is called. It's the kind of fleshy bits that connect the jaw. We don't have it as humans, but probably because we don't have these massive set of jaws that go back like this. But suffice it to say, even though I'm not 100% sure what I'm making here, I am, I'm having fun. I'm enjoying this guy. Even after doing that guy who turned out, yeah, all right, I guess. There's this sense of like, okay, well, I'm, I'm one drawing in, and that one didn't turn out terribly, so this one will probably be okay. And that's another reason that it's super beneficial to draw things that you enjoy, but also draw frequently. I know you see a lot of advice about drawing every day, and recently I've started to see counter advice that that's bad advice, that you should not draw every day, and I'm sure in a year or two somebody will take the opposite side of that. But I think that both sides would say that drawing frequently is beneficial. I think frequently is probably something that you have to determine for yourself, what you can fit into your schedule. But the more often you do it, the easier it is to do it again. For a lot of reasons. One, you don't feel quite as detached from it. You remember where everything is, where all that stuff is that you set. If you're working digitally, you remember your brush settings, hopefully. And it's just not that big a deal to get back into it. If you are working like I am, uh, where you're working analog, I've got all my tools set up right here. My brush pens are in front of me, my microphone, my stand for my music. I even got coasters for my drinks. Um, all of those things, I remember where they are. I, if I sit down and I haven't drawn in a while, it's like, where's my... Where's my 0.01? Where's my 0.05? Like, where are all my pens? And that makes it hard. But on the other side, when you're drawing frequently, for example, the fact that I just drew that guy and he worked out all right, I have less pressure with this guy for several reasons. One, I have reasonable... It is reasonable for me to assume that because my last drawing that I literally did... 10 minutes ago turned out all right, this one will probably turn out all right. Two, if this one doesn't turn out all right, I already had one that did, so it's not a complete bust. And even if today everything turned out poorly, I have the drawing that I was working on last night that turned out pretty decently. And so again, I just feel a little bit better about things. So if I keep going, if I keep moving, if I just keep drawing, it becomes easier to keep drawing. Reminds me a little bit of Dory, where she says, just keep swimming. There is some logic to that. There's a counterpoint to everything, and unfortunately or fortunately, my brain immediately goes to all the counterpoints. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, sometimes if you're banging your head against the wall, you don't want to keep banging your head against the wall. And that's true. So don't bang your head against the wall. Or if you're going to bang your head against the wall, make sure that it's a wall worth banging your head against. For me right now, I am enjoying working with reptiles and dragons and things like that. And so I will keep doing it and I'll keep learning new strategies of how to put them together. 
You'll notice that, especially on this page, I'm working just on heads. Heads are way less stressful for me. That's why the dragon that I just showed a minute ago uh, has a whole body, because I don't often work on whole bodies, because they stress me out a little bit. I always have to really stop and think about how to represent the claws or the hands, and how the feet function, and how the joints work when they connect to the body. But I did that over the last two days, specifically because I want to get better at those things. Now I'm back to just heads. I'm going to work on a couple different varieties and a couple different kinds. And then after that, I'm going to probably do a whole body again. I need to work on the stuff that I don't want to, the stuff that stresses me out. These markers have been my friends for a long time. These pens, actually, you can see right there. It's the Pigma Micron 01 is what I'm using right here. It's archival ink. I've used these for ages. Um, I don't know that I've ever had a single one die on me, which is either evidence of a good product or evidence of the fact that I don't work on them enough. But they're lovely, just in case you were wondering what I'm working on. They're not expensive. They are, for the most part, waterproof. I've done watercolor before and after on them, and it seems to work just fine. Um, I have noticed recently that you do need to make sure that it, the ink is totally dry, though. When I'm shifting media, I will often forget little things like that and will just start making marks and be then surprised when something doesn't work out quite the way I wanted it to. This toned paper is lovely, by the way. If you have not tried working with a, an earth tone paper, it is fantastic because right now, as I'm adding in all these pen marks, I'm adding in my shadows and my darks. But all of the mid-tones just kind of exist, and they really pop when you start taking in the white. Then your brain adjusts, and it remembers that the contrast levels are what they are, and it just makes it's just making it so much more fun. Really been enjoying using the white and black. I have some white and black charcoal that just arrived in the last couple days that I'll use in here too. Although this sketchbook so far has just been pen and ink. And I'm terrified, of course, that the second that I start working with charcoal that everything will get messy and gross. And as much as charcoal is awesome, I don't like getting dirty when I'm making my art, which is very, I'm sure very, very silly and very surprising to a lot of people. But I just, I don't like getting messy. So when I'm oil painting, um, it becomes a chore. I try very hard to keep the paints off myself. I've tried in recent years to wear gloves, I wear an apron, things like that. And again, it's, it's, it's easy to let something like that be a distractor. Like, oh, well, I'm, I'm just not going to paint because I don't have my, my setup ready and I don't want to get dirty. And, and so I just have things to deal with those pieces of my annoying self so that those don't become excuses. Because I still want to draw. I still want to paint. Um, so just because uh, it might make me dirty, I don't want to not do it. So I just built up the strategies. These pens though, I, you know, they're great. Haven't gotten me dirty really at all. I know most of you probably don't care about that at all. It's just not a big deal to you. I am a little bit envious. I've got a little kid right now and she loves getting dirty as most kids do. And there are moments where it's totally fine. And there are moments where it's like, I think I need to go in the other room for just a minute because you have sand falling out of all of your curly hair all over the place. And I am mostly contemplating how I need to clean it up and not enjoying this moment. And so I'm working on it, working on trying to be um, less agitated and weirded out by those kind of things. 
because it's really good and really beneficial for my girl to be able to do things that build her immune system and build her joy. Especially, maybe most especially, if they're things that weird me out a little bit, because I think that's part of being a parent, is realizing that your kid is not a carbon copy of you. They are to be their own human being. So don't try to force them into what you wanted to be, what your parents wanted you to be, or often exactly what your parents didn't want you to be. Hmm, where do we go next? I think we'll just go here. We'll see what happens. Let's try something a little bit, a little bit more bizarre, maybe. No guarantees on my part. It might not work. But whatever. Let's see what happens. Not thinking yet about what it's gonna be. I'm just thinking I want it to be a big blocky form. Let's have it come in. Uh, let's do a small eye. We'll do a small eye back here. I think he's gonna be a plant eater. So he's gonna have a, um, doesn't need to have the musculature going up, can have the side to side for chewing. So let's make it have a big chunk of musculature here at the back of where the jaw is going to be. Let's play with some of these shapes and see what happens. Ooh, I, hmm, let's see, let's see what happens here. Let's have, uh, and let's play with the three dimensionality a little bit so I can see. Okay. Uh, that's going to go way back in up there. Okay. So we're kind of looking down this way. I'm gonna see what happens. This is probably a terrible idea, but let's see what happens if we have the front jaw come out way further than, or the bottom jaw, sorry, come out way further than the top. I've got an idea here of what if this animal is using this giant protruding jaw as like a scoop almost like a filter feeder of some kind. It's scooping up vegetation. Let's get the angle on that a little bit more extreme. Scooping up vegetation and then taking it into the probably the back teeth, the molars, in order to chomp it up. So we're probably not going to need any teeth up here. And actually, the teeth that we're going to have are probably going to be way back in here. Probably not going to see them. So we can probably just let it, let it go for the moment. Just give it this tiny little eye, which will help kind of suggest the large nature of this creature. What a goofy looking thing. Goodness. Well, let's see what happens, huh? Uh, I think I'm going to flange this out. I think that'll kind of work. Doesn't have any horns or anything. Um, give it a colossal neck. Some folds of fat as the neck is like rolling in on itself so they can stretch when it's elongated or whatever it does. What a, what a weird looking dumpy thing. Uh, all right. Um, let's do just kind of a pretty standard. Let's have the light back behind it a little bit. Oh, then we won't get a lot of nice highlights. So, oh, well, we'll figure it out. We're not making that decision right now. We're just going to keep going and see what happens. Start creating some of this form with our shading. Not really even shading right now, it's more 
at like a really, really loose rendering. We're just using the pen marks to create contour. So we know that's how the, the shape moves. I'm talking a little bit less because I'm thinking more on this one about how this how this guy would function. If you're wondering why there's a little bit more uh, a few uh, there's more lapses in my speaking, that's why I'm trying to consider like what what would this be? What would that be? Why? Let's make sure it's actually in camera. What a goofy guy. I kind of like him though. It's kind of funky. Um, we've been using this 01 for a while. Let's shift to something bigger. We'll do some blocking in. I could probably put teeth back in here, but I don't think it's gonna really benefit us all that much. So I'm just going to black this in. It's important to play. Right now, this guy's just play. Like I was mentioning earlier, I got two drawings on this page already that are decent, which is even less pressure now to get this right. There's also the additional pressure. Um, again, I can't think of anything without some manner of caveat that because I have done the other drawings and they've turned out decently that I could give myself extra pressure now because it's like those other ones turned out well so now you gotta this one's got to turn out well too or you're gonna have to pull it off the video or but I'm not going to like regardless of how this guy turns out I'm just gonna he's gonna be a part of it he's gonna be a part of this it's beneficial for everyone to see that even if these two drawings seem you know, really good to you that potentially this third one won't. And that's fine. That's fine. Goodness. You're going to have so many ugly drawings along the path to getting most of your drawings decent. And I am, I am mediocre on my appreciation of these first two drawings, but I struggle with liking most of the stuff I produce. Having taught for so long, I've seen so many good pieces of art, and I feel like I have a really good understanding of my strengths and my many, many weaknesses artistically. And that can make it difficult to appreciate your little wins, your little gains. And it's important. It's important to try very hard to appreciate all of your artistic wins. If your eye is far more developed than your hand, which is my case, it can be very, very difficult to be satisfied or happy with anything you produce. And that's certainly me. I struggle to appreciate or be happy with almost anything I draw or paint. I also try to just celebrate the little teeny things that worked out well. It doesn't happen all the time. I'm not great at it. I certainly have the vast majority of the time where I'm just like, yep, yeah, that was pretty terrible, but it's terrible in the pursuit of good. And sometimes that's enough for me. And other times it makes it really hard to get into the next drawing. So if you're struggling with feeling like you're behind, like your artwork is not as good as you want it to be, it's not improving as fast as you want it to, I feel you. I understand that pain. And I would also like to encourage you to just keep moving. Acknowledge that pain, that discomfort. Hold it in the palm of your hand and then let it go. Because it is going to do nothing to help you. If you truly want to grow, if you truly want to improve, just keep going. Acknowledge the misery. Acknowledge the pain when it occurs and then let it go. Like you just rescued a little bird that hit your window and you can't hold on to it forever and you're just gonna have to let it go. Let it get back out there and create waves again and hopefully not hit another window pane. That's how I think we should all react to our angst 
and anguish and misery about our piece not turning out the way we wanted to or our artistic improvement not going as quickly as we wanted to. Hold on to it for a minute. Let it go. Take a break. Get back to work. There's so many cool things that we get to make that will come into the world because we stick to it. So please, please, please stick to it and keep making, keep making cool things. Cool things that probably have very little purpose and therefore are the most important of things. Not everything has to have beautifully striated and wonderfully articulated purpose. Sometimes things can just be for joy. Joy is important. This life can be so hard that if you can find things to just simply bring you some joy, cling to those, graft them into your life, make them a permanent fixture of your reality. I'm gonna kind of flange this jaw out a little bit. Like this. Don't remember where I first learned that technique, but it might've been Alfonso Dunn, who hopefully I'm not mispronouncing his name, but I, I believe he has a YouTube channel. If he does not, I can, um, then I can link to some of his other material, but he does a lot of pen and ink work and it's wonderful. And if he does in fact have a YouTube channel and I'm remembering that correctly, I'll link it in the description down below, but he's a wonderfully gifted and skilled articulator of pen and ink techniques. I stalled there because um, gifted can be such a loaded term, one that implies that somebody didn't work for the skill they have. But I think that really what I gravitate to about him is he does, he's very calming in how he talks and how he instructs. And I think he might have been the person that I first saw really using your hatching lines to indicate the flow and the contour of the surface that you're working on. And it's a wonderful technique. You can start to see some of that here, how it implies these lines going around and how the jaw flanges out a little bit there. You keep going with these scale structures around the jaw. In the last couple days as I've been working with these white pens, I've been not very good about weaving them in, in that I, I should be waiting till I have a lot of my black in before I start doing the whites. <coughs> I haven't been great about that, I've just been excited, and so I just keep moving them in. So on these pieces I've actually been better, like that one up there, I didn't start taking in the whites until I was pretty far into the the drawing, which was a much wiser idea. Get some more coffee. Not 100% sure how to handle this bulbousy bit on the end. Just kind of keep shading around it. We'll see what happens. My throat's starting to be mad at me for talking so long. I haven't been in the classroom for a little while now and... <sighs> takes more water to lubricate the pipes. I'm actually liking how this is this is turning out, this weird fellow. Don't know about too much texture up here because I'm kind of liking the fact that this almost looks like a plate up on top of his head. So I'm going to create that more as an indication there too. Get some more of this texture coming down. I think, 
think there'd probably be a little ridge above the eye. There often is. Just kind of imply that a little bit and there's usually some manner of shading and inset underneath the eye. So try to indicate some of that as well. And then it usually comes out underneath. So we'll have these lines kind of curve, counter curving there around. That should be good. Sometimes it's hard to do that and not make it look like the guy's grumpy. It's probably a girl. This, uh, this one's probably a female because I'm envisioning it as being one of the larger members of its herd or flock or whatever it is. And in reptiles, often the female is the larger, especially in snakes. Definitely feel like I need to double check that on crocodilians though, because I think that male crocodilians are the large ones. Oh, my finger got a little bit of the white from one of the pens on it at some point, and I'm tracking that down here a little bit. Not much. Maybe not enough that you can even notice on the camera, but interesting. Okay, so I guess I didn't wait quite long enough before starting to work on this piece underneath. I've probably been dragging some of those. It didn't smudge though, it looks like. Not gonna do a whole lot over here with the neck. I'm mostly just trying to get some line and texture in. I just didn't want it to be blank, it's, but it's just, I'm not as interested in that. I'm much more interested in what's going on with this head. But if I left it blank, I feel like it'd be distracting. We'll start working on some of the, some of the white reflective parts and see what happens. Oh, I just noticed this, this tongue feels super weird um, right here. So let's, Let's carve that down in a little bit more. That's a little better. Just feels weird. We also don't have any texture on the tongue. So let's, let's see, this would probably be coming up like this. Get a couple lines to kind of indicate. The way the surface of it's moving. Might have helped, might have not. Kind of looks funky now. All right, let's start getting some of the highlights up on top of this almost crown here. Unlike my, the microns I was talking about earlier, I'm not 100% sold on these. I think these are just from Amazon, pretty... Probably an Amazon brand kind of thing for the, the pen here. So I'm not super stoked about how they've been handling. So I will keep looking. If you have any recommendations, that'd be awesome. I know that there are manufacturers of good quality inks I haven't spent a lot of time looking into it. It still gives me a nice effect, but when I'm trying to do like these large areas up here, it just doesn't quite feel like it's doing what I want it to. And it's pretty heavy, so it leaves like a physical texture on top later, which isn't great. Which is another reason why I think it's beneficial to work the blacks underneath and then transition to using the white highlight at the end. We're gonna put a little bit of highlight out on this part though, to kind of infer that this thing is so bulbousy that it's coming out on the other side of the uh, 
or out beyond the lips. We'll do this a bit on the tongue. I think that'll, that'll help the tongue kind of feel more tuggy. There you go, that's not bad. What an interesting, what an interesting madam. I like it. I like it. It's kind of fun. It's very different. Very um, intriguing. So. Cool. I think that's what we're calling this session. Thanks for hanging out. Have a great day, y'all. See you soon.